Dear Ambassador, thank you very much for starting our conference and for your insightful remarks and for keeping the time. Thank you very much. And now I would kindly ask Mr. Masuros to come and take over and guide us through the first panel. If I can have the panelists join us, uh, Ibrahim and Paul and Elias, and of course, Mr. Pichilis, uh, Pablo, you can do it from here, or you can sit down there, whatever you want. Maybe you're here. Yeah, I guess it's easier to do it here. I can as well. You have uh, your countdown clock there. Okay. So you can see the time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning all. My name is Pavlos Masouros. I'm managing partner of Masouros Attorneys at Law based in Athens in The Hague. And um, I have the joy to welcome you to a very interesting panel with a very distinguished set of speakers. Um, and I'm gonna go right into introducing uh, the distinguished speakers. So uh, I've got Ibrahim uh, Rahbari from uh, City. He is global head of FX analysis and, and content at City. Uh, Paul Kutus is head of the European Commission's unit on the economies of the member states, when in particular uh, uh, in, with regard to Greece. Uh, Jan Hadzias from uh, Goldman Sachs is chief economist and head of uh, global economics. Uh, George Pitsilis is the governor of the Internal Authority for Public Revenue. And last but not least, Elias Lekos, chief economist at Piraeus Bank. So um, I'm going to kick this off by stating that, of course, the reason why uh, we're gathered here today is to learn more about whether Greece is indeed recovering. There, are, there is an abundance of positive news in the global financial press, no doubt. Uh, but in, in my view, the, the, the economy remains a bit fragile. I mean, the numbers look good. Sovereign yields are low. Uh, Greek corporate securities are um, uh, marking uh, very good returns, but I think that there is a concern about the fundamentals of, uh, of the Greek economy. Can it sustain growth in the long term? And that's what I would like to be focusing on uh, in this panel uh, today, and also to understand how is Greece going to um, uh, to tackle a potential recession or slowdown or stagnation of the economy in the coming uh, year or years. So uh, let me start with, with Jan. Um, I mean, uh, Bloomberg reports that the average U.S. forecaster uh, currently puts a 33% probability on a U.S. recession kicking in in 2020. I mean, where do you see the risk and what do you think are the implications for the wider economy and, and Greece specifically, Jan? All right, thank you. Uh, and that's uh, obviously a key question. I think the, uh, the consensus of forecasters is pretty negative. You can see that in the recession risk, you know, 33, 35% were uh, the numbers in surveys taken by Bloomberg and Reuters. Uh, on the probability of a U.S. recession starting in the, in the next 12 months. Uh, that's probably even a higher number than it looks because it's well known that forecasters are pretty reluctant to adopt recession as the base case because it's very painful for your career uh, to forecast a recession that doesn't happen. Um, so typically when you see numbers in the 30s or approaching 40%, that actually means that many forecasters think recession is pretty much the base case. Um, so so pr pretty negative view. Our own view is uh, more positive. Our number would be 20%. Uh, we think that uh, a lot of uh, forecasters are probably overestimating the predictive power of factors such as the flat yield curve. We think there have been quite a lot of changes in the fixed income markets that make that, uh, uh, that indicator uh, probably a little less meaningful than it has been in the past. And we think that uh, many forecasters underestimate 
the resilience of the U.S. and global economy, uh, in particular as far as private sector balance sheets are concerned. Private sector balance sheets, we think, uh, are in much better shape than in the later stages of the last couple of cycles. Uh, best measure, in our view, is the private sector financial balance, just the difference between uh, the total income and total spending of all households and businesses. That was deeply negative in the later stages of the last couple of cycles. Uh, now it shows a surplus of about 5% of GDP. That's true in the US, it's true in the Euro area, it's true in Japan, it's true in most of the advanced economies around the world, uh, and we think that reduces uh, the risk of, of recession. So we actually have a moderate acceleration in global growth uh, in, our, in our baseline. You can see that in our, in our US numbers, at least on a sequential basis, uh, a um, you know, half to three quarter of a percentage point acceleration. We have a similar accel acceleration in the, in the Euro area. Uh, and I think that is important for, for Greece. I mean, if you look at the Greek numbers, um, you know, unlike in most of the Euro area, you haven't really seen a sequential slowdown in 2019. Uh, the way that you, you've, you've observed really pretty much everywhere else. I mean, most clearly in Germany, but, uh, but even in uh, economies such as Spain. While things are still pretty good, there has been uh, a deceleration. There's been, uh, a, um, at least for now, an end to the labor market improvement that you have had been seeing in, uh, in prior years. Uh, Greece has no, n not yet seen that, at least based on the, on the data that, uh, that are available, and as you know, um, you know, some of those data are uh, a bit more, bit more lagging, but uh, it does seem that uh, Greece has held up well so far. If you saw continued weakness in the, in the euro area, I would be pretty concerned that ultimately that would spill over to Greece as well, and some of the favorable dynamics that you, that you talked about would, uh, would, would, would end. But um, um, at least under our baseline forecast, uh, there should be somewhat more support uh, and obviously, there's a lot of room still for cyclical improvement uh, in, the, in the Greek economy. The unemployment rate, uh, while it's come down a lot, is still over 17%. Um, you know, inflation is ex extremely low. So uh, if the external environment and the domestic policy environment uh, remain broadly favorable, you could see uh, well above trend growth rates for many years to come um, before you would, uh, you would start to hit capacity constraints. Okay, uh, so that's a very, so I guess overall it's an optimist outlook on... Uh, it's an optimistic on, uh, on outlook the on the global economy, and uh, if, if that's the right outlook, then it should be um, at least uh, at the margin also positive for Greece. Okay, so Abraham, do you, do you share uh, this, uh, this view? And, and I mean, of course, um, you're, you're credited with coming up with a term Grexit. Uh, uh, several years ago, so I cannot resist the temptation <laughs> of, of asking you uh, whether you think the same is still possible in today's environment. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Pavlos. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Let me briefly comment on what, um, what Jan said. Our, our house has a very similar view. Uh, our, our colleagues on our U.S. team and our global colleagues also think that recession risks are there, but they're, they're, they're possibly overstated by some of the numbers that are being thrown around. I know a few other houses say the same thing, so it reminds me a little bit of uh, that statistic that's thrown around that 80% of people think they're better than average drivers. So in this case, um, I do think maybe some of what we see in the financial press doesn't necessarily reflect uh, expectations by, by many other analyst houses. And when it comes to Greece, I think we should be clear that a, a number of the reasons why Greece may be holding up better than some of the other economies globally are actually reflecting uh, weaknesses in a, uh, in a certain way. One Jan already touched on is, of course, Greece has gone through a very deep recession, so it has a lot to catch up on, but it is really mainly because it, it had fallen so far behind. And the second is, and I think that's a key topic for today, that uh, Greece isn't that well integrated into the global economy quite yet. The export sector is quite small, so it's been somewhat sheltered from that global manufacturing recession. Again, that's probably at the margin a positive in the current context, but at the same time, it's something that Greece obviously needs to, needs to change over time in order to, uh, to galvanize its potential. Uh, let, me, let me make three points with regard to your, to your, to your second reference. Uh, first, uh, let, me, let me just uh, 
restate and, and clarify that even though we added to the lexicon a couple of years ago, we never expected or advocated a Greek exit from, 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 from the Eurozone. Uh, and, and, and so, as a second point, I, I can say I'm very pleased that this isn't really a, a, a topic of, of current uh, discussion uh, among you know, the public sector, but very much among investors as well. It's not a, a, a current concern, and I think that reflects clearly a combination of three factors. It was a decision by Greece that it uh, saw its own interest in remaining within, within the Eurozone. A decision, of course, by Europe to prioritize the integrity of uh, monetary union over some of the other uh, considerations. And, of course, it had to somehow uh, be made to work, i.e., we have seen very significant macroeconomic adjustment in Greece that uh, I think has made its place in the Eurozone certainly in many narrow ways very, very sustainable. But at the same time, uh, my final point here would be clearly the job is not entirely done. Clearly there's no room for complacency, and I, and I say this with respect to the Eurozone institutional architecture, but also Greece's place within it. It's a very low bar to say, you know, Greece is uh, in a in a, in a position to remain within the Eurozone, it's a very low bar for the Eurozone to say we're not disintegrating. That's not the bar for success. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about today will be how can we make sure that the Eurozone and Greece are places to prosper, not just survive. So, uh, you know, I, I would say the, the topic of Brexit is somewhat off the table, but I, but I hope that we can, we can move on to other issues that are probably more central to Greece's future. Okay, so it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very, um important remark you made that Grexit is, is off the agenda for good, at least for the time being, I guess. And uh, I would like to, to um, uh, ask the third uh, banker of our company this morning, Elias. Um, so we see that the overall outlook for the global economy and the economy of the Eurozone is, is optimistic, uh, at least, but still the growth rates do not reflect what we were hoping for a couple of years ago. So I'm, uh, I'm sensing there might be some stagnation ahead. And so bearing this in mind that there might be some slowdown, especially in the economies of, of the Eurozone, uh, I'm wondering what do you think that are the steps that Greece in particular should be taking proactively <coughs> in order to counterbalance a potential slowdown that might hit it in the near term? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, well, it is true, and we can say that once again, the Greek economy finds itself in a different phase vis-a-vis -vis, uh, at least the European economy. Uh, we are trying to grow at, at, at the same time when in, it, we're not expecting a recession, but certainly you can say that you know the European growth is subpar, to say the least. So we are trying to grow uh, at, at a very difficult uh, uh, European, at least, uh, environment. And uh, it is true that since we got out of the crisis, since 2017, Greece has been growing. Th this is not a problem. The problem is that, you know, uh, we have been growing and we have been trapped in a very narrow range. GDP in Greece up until uh, this year has been trapped in a range between one and a half to two percent. And certainly uh, after having lost 25 percent of GDP, we should be doing more. And we should start thinking which are these conditions that will allow us to do more uh, even in this tough um, uh, global economic environment. And I think there are three issues that we should consider. The first one has to do with the, the legacies of the past. And here I'm talking about debt, both private and public debt. But let's assume that this is in, in, in a process of being somewhat uh, uh, resolved. The other two issues, and we can come back to that later on if you want. The other two issues that we should consider, first has to do with uh, 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 fiscal policy, and the second has to do with the structural weaknesses of the Greek economy. As far as the fiscal policy uh, is concerned, I think that fiscal policy is a, a, is a main tool in an environment where you have zero uh, interest rates and monetary policy cannot do a lot. Fiscal policy is a very important tool. And in Greece, we are trapped into this 3.5% uh, primary surplus. Uh, and since the imposition of this 3.5%, th this level has, has, 
has taken a life of its own. It, it, has, it, it has taken a theological almost uh, importance in the, in the mind of, of, of most people. And one way to say that you know, we can do more with the fiscal policy is to say, let's try and renegotiate. Let's lower the 3.5% to something else. Which is fine, but it's going to be difficult to, to, um, to execute, at least in the short term. So one alternative that one can think is not to lower the 3.5% threshold, but to change the use of this uh, uh, primary surplus. Not many people are, are aware of the fact that this 3.5%, which in, in levels in euros translates to roughly 7 billion per year, has to be put aside into a buffer to finance or to uh, make sure that external debt is repaid. So, in reality, you have an outflow of 7 billion out of the Greek economy year in, year out. One way to achieve uh, a fiscal stimulus without breaching the 3.5% uh, uh, primary surplus uh, target is to change the use. Let's say that you can use 2% out of the 3.5% uh, to, to, to put it on the buffer to make sure that external debt is repaid, and you can use the remaining 1.5% as a permanent f uh, fiscal stimulus that can finance infrastructure projects. I'm not advocating to, to spend more money on, uh, you know, government uh, pet projects or giving more money to, uh, to boost consumption, but certainly in Greece we need infrastructure investment. Uh, public sector investment is in all-time low, and we can definitely use, make use of that 1.5% uh, to stimulate uh, the economy in a positive way, in a way that it will uh, adjust the, the potential GDP growth in the years uh, to come. Uh, and the, the third pillar of, of, of our understanding and of, of our actions regarding the Greek economy, I think it has to do with structural changes. I don't know how many of you spent your time reading the IMF reports and the European Commission's report about Greece, uh, but certainly if you read the last report from the IMF on the special issue regarding the competitiveness of the Greek economy, there is one paragraph, paragraph 25. And there, in one paragraph, you can see, even if you don't know anything about the Greek economy, you can see all the problems of the Greek economy condensed into one paragraph. Very simply, what it says is that throughout the crisis, there has been substantial reform on the labor market. As a result, the labor compensation collapsed. It didn't decline. Labor costs in Greece collapsed. But at the same time, you had increases in corporate taxation, increases in uh, social security contributions, both from the employees and the employers, and because of all the Grexit uh, um, fears, you had an increase in the, in the cost of capital. And at the same time, because you never did structural reforms on the services and product markets, Greek corporates were able to increase their margins. So these forces, fully counterbalanced the decline in labor costs. So if we want to look forward, we, we should really try and remedy these issues. The IMF doesn't say, of course, that they were the, the ones that they imposed the increases in corporate tax or in social security contribution taxes, but okay, it's a new government, it's a new page, in, in, it's a new era in the Greek economy, and we can try to, uh, to address these issues now that we have the luxury to discuss them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elias. One of, I think one of the most interesting things you noted is that um, we need some fiscal stimulus in Greece, and public infrastructure remains at an all-time low. Uh, it is true that uh, fiscal stimulus as a tool to resolving crisis has to a certain extent been demonized over the past decade. It has been held um, um, as a policy that increases public debt. So, but speaking of fiscal policy, I think uh, I should take it to George now. Uh, I mean, George, your agency's role is uh, in dealing with the fiscal part of the required adjustment is of course critical. And uh, there are many who say we don't need to be spending more money, and we don't need more government spending. Uh, what we instead need to do is to fight, um, to increase the revenues, to fight tax evasion. So we'd like to ask you, I mean, uh, in the new digital era, how is 
uh, the Greek tax system and your agency role adjusting? I mean, what does, uh, how can the tax administration take advantage of the developments we see on the digital front? What is the plan? Thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, digital transformation of the uh, Greek tax and customs administration is, is cornerstone, cornerstone to our reform policy. So during the past years we have developed an IT strategy and uh, a roadmap in order first of all to improve the quality of services we provide mm -hmm. to our taxpayers and businesses and in order to assist them to be more compliant. Uh, and on the other side to improve the uh, performance of our audits and controls so as to ensure a level playing field. Following our plan, and we, we manage every year to digitalize uh, services. Uh, for example, this year we digitalized uh, filing of withholding taxes on salaries, uh, uh, interest and dividends and royalties. And by the end of the year, we, we hope to be able to open the platform for uh, electronic filing of real estate transfer tax. But uh, the most important project for us these days uh, is the uh, uh, full, let's just say, uh, digitalization of the accounting and tax obligations of businesses uh, in Greece. It's a trifold project that involves electronic bookkeeping, electronic invoicing, and online cash registers. Electronic bookkeeping, as, or as we like to call it in Greece, my data, my digital accounting and tax application, is a platform <coughs> that receives all relevant gross revenue and expenses information from all businesses and cost constitutes the, uh, their accounting and tax record. It will lead into pre-filling uh, of tax returns and calculation of uh, their tax obligations. Electronic invoicing, I don't need to say too much about it, apart from the fact that we intend to make it the uh, main channel of uh, information sent to our uh, database. And online cash registers, it's a project that has been discussed for many years in, uh, in Greece. We're making it happen, especially because we, we, we found the missing link, what to do with all that information from online cash registers. Uh, it is the second, let's just say, most important channel of information for us. And uh, the idea is to build uh, a transaction by transaction transmittal of uh, data to, uh, to my data. So uh, our, our intention is to launch all these projects within 2020 and educate uh, the, the people, the businesses, and also our staff in the new system. I must say that it is very fortunate that the new government and especially the Ministry of Finance has endorsed uh, the project since its beginning and very recently on Friday they passed primary legislation that will allow us to, um, uh, to introduce the necessary regulatory framework for all that. And in a nutshell what I would say is that there is a lot of work ahead of us because all this data uh, will facilitate businesses but also enhance our audit capacities. Uh, the volume of information we will get is, uh, is something that we couldn't imagine a few years ago. So we are eager to do the job because we believe it's a win-win uh, situation. It will make everyday life of uh, businesses uh, much easier, but it will also increase compliance and uh, public revenue. And I would say that once we have finalized it, we will be among the few countries worldwide that will have an all-inclusive uh, digital environment for the accounting and tax filling obligation of businesses. Okay, thank you, George. This is, uh, <coughs> seems to me a very positive development and uh, I would like to ask Paul, who is, I guess, monitoring all these uh, reforms and measures to be taken. I mean, last Wednesday, uh, the Eurogroup um, uh, agreed to release the second tranche of the debt, uh, the debt measures based on a positive 
uh, report by the Commission on the Greek Economy. So uh, we heard George speaking of um, uh, an ongoing reform in, uh, in the digitalization of, of, of the tax revenues agency. But I mean, in your view, if Greece is to keep up uh, these uh, positive developments, what are the key issues that Greece should watch in order for the next reviews to be as positive as the last one was? Thanks, uh, and, and, and also thanks, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today. Um, no, as you said, the, the Eurogroup uh, last week uh, gave a positive uh, political uh, uh, endorsement on, on the reform process in Greece. Uh, and released the, the second tranche of the debt measures around uh, 770 million euro. That was obviously a very positive uh, signal. Uh, it's uh, based uh, on, on a number of considerations. Uh, first of all, uh, the Greek government, when the new Greek administration uh, was uh, clearly committed from the beginning to, uh, to meet and to follow up on the, on the commitments that were given to the Eurogroup in June 2018 at the end of the program to complete all the major flagship reforms uh, uh, that were launched, which are, of course, multi-year projects. Um, some of these uh, commitments that were due for this report were met uh, outright, like a growth-friendly budget for 2020 or, or the, the removal of capital controls. Uh, on others, uh, on all the others, actually, uh, uh, so, some were met outright, but those that were not met outright uh, were brought back on track uh, with, uh, with credible plans and with uh, also in some cases complementary action that strengthens, uh, uh, strengthens the reform. Uh, another aspect is that Greece uh, in uh, some respects has gone well beyond uh, the commitments uh, given. So the, the new administration has, right from the beginning, uh, launched uh, a comprehensive uh, pro-growth agenda, uh, which has encompassed uh, so far already a number of uh, legislative uh, uh, initiatives, like the development law, which, which went into investment licensing, and a couple of other uh, issues around the business environment, which is, of course, a key, key plank of reforms. Uh, also, organization of the state, more centralization around the presidency. Uh, a whole new launch of reforms on digital governance, uh, some, uh, some flexibilization steps on labor markets, uh, as well as new momentum on privatization. So this, this was a sort of a comprehensive strategy that was launched and uh, 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 th this was appreciated by the Eurogroup. Uh, and also all these processes were done in very close and good cooperation with the, with the institutions, which has provided additional uh, reassurance, I think, to, to European partners and I think also to markets. Uh, generally, the, 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 the growth uh, agenda of the new government has been well received by the markets and probably also the fact that there's a stable government with a, uh, 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 with a solid mandate uh, that, that, could, that could increase uh, stability and predictability, which has, uh, has uh, traditionally been an issue uh, for Greece. Uh, some things have already been mentioned. Bond yields have fallen, confidence is up to pre-crisis levels. Capital controls have been phased out, and the latest data suggests that growth is actually stronger than we expected and might, uh, might well come in above 2% uh, uh, this year. Um, now, all this, and I think uh, it, was, uh, it was Ibrahim who mentioned there's no room for complacency. Uh, there, there is no uh, mission accomplished uh, at this stage uh, because we are reaching now uh, an important next phase uh, for, the, uh, for the government. Uh, when we say that confidence has increased, indeed, confidence is confidence in something. <laughs> and it's the continued delivery of, uh, of reforms. And, and that's why probably after a strong start, the next uh, couple of months uh, will also be uh, extremely critical to ensure that the reform momentum uh, is, uh, is sustained on the ground. Um, and, and this encompasses, even in the short term, a whole array of, uh, of issues. You asked if, to identify a few. Uh, that's uh, in fiscal, financial, and structural. On the fiscal side, uh, making further progress with the clearance of arrears. There's a credible plan on the table that should clear practically all arrears uh, by the end of the year. Very important. Um, public administration reform, George has outlined. Uh, you very welcome, but obviously this is the start of a, of a pretty big project. Uh, Enfia property tax, uh, a, uh, a, a base broadening uh, reform of objective values uh, for, for the next round. On the financial side, um, 
a number of work streams uh, that uh, that should be firmed up based on on the discussion so far. That is the the uh, in particular reform and harmonisation of insolvency regimes uh, by by April 2020, which should uh, which should also involve the uh, the um, the realization of uh, the, 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 the ability to enforce uh, collateral across the board, uh, which will be an important step towards normalization, and the range of other work streams from e-auctions to state guarantees. Basically, NPL reduction has to be a comprehensive uh, strategy. The Hercules scheme, which I think will come up throughout the day, uh, is an important initiative. It's not directly part of the commitments, but it's also an important initiative to follow, where we will be then looking at the implementation stage. And on the structural side, uh, it's essentially about continuing and building on the reforms that have been launched so far. That's uh, starting from the cadastre, where we see clear progress. Forest maps have been practically completed, but the transition to the new entity uh, still, needs to, still needs to move on. Uh, energy markets, where we should see the target market rollout, uh, target model rollout uh, this year. And I think we, we, we are expecting uh, and looking forward to a comprehensive uh, uh, en uh, uh, energy and climate strategy uh, by the middle of December. Uh, while, of course, also the, uh, the antitrust remedy uh, uh, on Lignite has to be uh, also followed up. But there we are looking really at strategic uh, approach. Uh, and uh, on privatization, keeping up the momentum, there's a couple of, uh, uh, of transactions. We've seen uh, very good progress on Hellenicon, but also Athens International Airport, DEPA, Ignatia, you name it. Um, and finally, if I can say public administration uh, reform is also something that's still ongoing where probably the two key planks are continuing with, uh, with reforming the, uh, the, the structure for appointments in the public sector on a professional and depoliticized basis. And also uh, a big project uh, uh, where I think we, we, we see there's good ownership there on an integrated HR management system. So essentially just to know what you're doing and to be able to, to plan more strategically. Now this is just, uh, this is just the short term, <laughs> which is already quite a, quite a project. Um, but of course, the long term starts in the short term. So uh, you, have to, you have to build the basis. In the longer term, I would just say that I agree with Ibrahim that, uh, that one of the things uh, that uh, Greece will probably need to look at is uh, the fact that it is, for its size, a relatively closed economy, which shelters it at some moments, but which is fundamentally a weakness for longer term growth. I don't know if I have still time one minute to react on the fiscal policy. Uh, or later. We are running out of time, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but there will be an opportunity to, to briefly touch upon, uh, you know, and make a sort of a closing statement. But very briefly, you know, I just would like to, to take these five minutes to learn as much as I can from you, gentlemen. And uh, so I would like to focus a bit on foreign direct investment. I think this is at relatively low levels, and Greece should be doing more. Uh, but uh, I think the overall outlook of the global economy doesn't seem to be ideal. There is a trade war between U.S. and China, Ibrahim. So do you think that all that Chinese investment that currently is in place in Greece, uh, because I think China champions everyone else in terms of foreign direct investment in Greece, do you think it is likely that as a byproduct of this trade war, China might start withdrawing its investments from uh, Europe and Greece in particular? Yes, let me, let me be very quick in the interest of time. Uh, one, I do think that these issues around China's place in the global economy are very deep. They're eventually potentially transformational. And they go beyond, obviously, the current negotiation uh, dynamic between uh, the, the, the US and uh, and China, and, and of course have been affecting European policy already, and I think that's only going to grow over time. I'm sure Paul could, could touch on it uh, a lot more. Greece is unusual in Europe because it's much more exposed to Chinese investment than almost anybody else, and of course China is a huge uh, source of foreign direct investment in an environment where uh, FDI is la lacking, so it's critical, I think, for, uh, for, for, for Greece to diversify. And I don't think the bottleneck will be that the Chinese will decide to withdraw, but I think whether that's European partners or, or the US, I think there will be a certain amount of pressure on Greece not to rely uh, too, too strongly on, uh, on, on Chinese investment. And there are specific areas of concern, as okay. you know, whether that's in IT or whether that's around the port and, and, and other strategic issues. So uh, in, in summary, I think it is a, it is a, it's a major issue, and I think it just uh, tells you that there, it's, it's incumbent for Greece to diversify its FDI. Okay. Thank just, you. Uh, so, can Elias, I just, can yes. I just, yeah, please. How, I, I, I was just about to, to ask you, but please, uh, 
How, how can Greece diversify in terms of FTI? At that point, I don't, honestly, I, my view or my understanding of the situation is a little bit uh, different than, than the, the consensus. And uh, in fact, I would say that Greece has been extremely efficient and successful in attracting FDI. I, I know that that's not reflected on the official data, but I think that uh, we, we have been so successful that in a couple of years' time, we will run out of uh, stuff to sell. I mean, uh, honestly, if you look at it, uh, for instance, the telecom, telecoms, we have three companies, all three are foreign-owned. The pharmaceutical companies, they have been, uh, they have, uh, have been very active in, uh, in, uh, in uh, M&A. Uh, the, the hospital sector, it's totally controlled by foreign capital. Uh, the insurance firm, with the exception of national insurance, which is anyway up for sale, if I understand correctly, all other insurance firms in Greece are controlled by uh, 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 foreign capital. Uh, and bet the betting sector, the fish farming, uh, the, I can go on, the, uh, sector after sector, it is dominated by foreign capital. I'm fully um, uh, aware that this is not reflected in the official data, maybe because for tax optimization reasons, you know, these transactions do not you know, go through the, 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 the Greek banking sector. Uh, but uh, I think that in a couple of years' time, you know, uh, we will have a different problem. We will, have, we will see that, you know, in the past we were monitoring the health of the Greek economy based on the current account deficit. So in the past we were saying that we, we are uh, uncompetitive because we have a large current account deficit, meaning that you know, uh, uh, imports were uh, significantly above exports. I think that in two, three years' time, we will be having an, an issue in the financial account where you know, uh, uh, outflows of capital, because okay. now we're seeing the benefit of FDI. We see the inflow of capital coming to Greece, being invested, creating uh, you know, investments, jobs, exports, but in a few years' time, that capital will start generating profits, okay. and these profits will have to be repatriated. So, I, and that in con combination with the fact that a big chunk of the Greek debt is foreign, that I think will start creating outflows on the financial rather than on the current mm -hmm. account uh, okay. balance. So that's an interesting uh, viewpoint on, on things. So, that's, so, Jan, do you think that if we do experience growth in, in the Eurozone and the, the, the ECB is likely to tighten its monetary policy, do you think that this tightening might stop all this flow of capital into Greece and other economies of the periphery of the Eurozone? I think it would be a, uh, a negative development, but I think it's very, very far away, even okay. if uh, Europe does somewhat better <laughs> in, the, in the next year or so, the, the ECB is not going to uh, you know, move away from the current, uh, you know, minus 50 basis points uh, uh, deposit rate and continued QE um, for a very long time, probably at least two years from, uh, from here. Um, even if numbers came in somewhat stronger than we thought, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think you'd, uh, uh, you, you're so far away from the inflation target. Um, there is uh, so much more um, belief among the newer generation of ECB policymakers that the inflation target should be symmetric. Uh, there is a framework discussion underway. Um, so even if you got closer to 2%, uh, I think just as in, in the US, you'd have uh, a lot of people arguing that we've been below the target for so, such a long period that we should l let things run ahead a little bit. Um, so I think it'd be a very negative development if the if the okay. ECB started to tighten, but I also think it's very unlikely. Okay, thank you. Well, gentlemen, we're out of time. There were a couple more interesting questions we could uh, keep on discussing, but unfortunately we have to leave the floor to uh, other people. So thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us all these interesting insights, and uh, thank you all for uh, for attending this. So thank you.